Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter i3 Insights, in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you might know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Daniel Grioli and I'm the Market Fox columnist for i3 Insights. One of our aims at the podcast is to chat with a wide variety of guests drawn from different parts of the investment and finance world. We encourage listeners to check out our previous episodes where we consider all sorts of topics including asset allocation, emerging markets, after-tax investing and quantitative investing. You can follow us on Twitter at i3invest and at market underscore fox. No other asset class is as near and dear to the heart of most Australians as residential real estate. Whether it's baby boomers boasting that the value of their house has doubled or millennials complaining that they can't afford a deposit, everyone is a self-professed property expert. Today I'm joined by Paul Castron. He co-founded Castron Gilbert, a real estate firm specialising in luxury real estate in Melbourne's eastern suburbs, over 30 years ago. We'll cover many interesting topics in this podcast, including what it was like to work in real estate during Australia's last recession, what's the best way to bid at an auction, how to decide if you, if you should renovate or sell, and much, much more. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Paul to the podcast. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Daniel, I'm uh, excited to be part of your podcast. So I'm looking forward to having a chat. It's fun. Everybody loves real estate, don't they? That's right. I, I, I'm trying to figure out, do you think it's loved more or less than football? More. More? You know why? Why? Because you make money out of it. That's and true. People love making money and they need somewhere to live. That's true. That's true. So tell us, Paul, how did you get started in real estate? So, yes, an interesting story. I did the valuations course at RMIT and um, I got a job. Um, the, I know the exact date. It was Monday, the 1st of December, 1980, and I became a cadet real estate agent and a cadet valuer because I'd done the valuations course at RMIT for a firm, Gull and Gilbert, in Blackburn Road in Sindal. And my first boss was Dennis Gilbert and Stuart Gull. And uh, Stuart Gull was the big South Melbourne football player. Um, who, who was a very good player and Dennis Gilbert was a registered valuer and I needed to um, uh, shadow a registered valuer to get uh, my registration uh, in valuation. So it was actually, most people um, mark where they were by an event that happened in their life and uh, of course that very first week John Lennon got shot. And so when I was in my car driving valuations over to another icon of the industry, his name was Chris Stewart, we would go over to Whitehorse Road, Box Hillies. Um, it was called Eastern Suburbs Permanent, which became the permanent, RESI permanent, the Bank of Melbourne, and then Chris Stewart became a director of Westpac. He since passed away. And I used to drop the valuations over to Chris. He used to say, Paul, are the valuations accurate? I'm lending against these. I'd say, Chris, they're fine. And so that was my starting in real estate. So that's coming up 38 years ago. So what was it like pre-internet? You would have had to actually oh. do some work back then. I can't. It's hard to ma it's hard to fathom or imagine what it was like pre-internet. Um, you know, things were very different. The way you advertised, the way you prepared properties for marketing, the way you prepared contracts. Of course, soft contracts, digital now. Um, uh, right through to the way that you take inquiries. So real estate used to be very slow because in the original days no faxes we used to send all the script for the boards and 
might take 10 days for a board to get erected now it's 24 hours um, and uh, there, there were, look there, it, it was it is just so different it, it used to run in hot spots so Saturdays and Sundays were the hot spots because that's when the newspaper came out Saturday morning and uh, there were no mobile phones back in those days, Daniel. God, I'm sounding like my grandma, aren't I? I'm sounding like I come from the 1930s Depression era. <laughs> Did you walk to school barefoot? <laughs> I used to get those stories from my parents. It's, yeah, milk the cows first and then ride the horse to the uh, station and then catch the train. Uh, look, you, uh, real estate, um, the way it is now, of course, it's much more efficient and you've effectively got, you know, a massive computer in your hand that you stick in your pocket and... Uh, you, you run your business that way, but it used to run in hotspots, so it was very different. You know, Saturday was alive, and Monday to Friday was getting prepared for the Saturday. Uh, uh, that would be, but, but you know, the, the, the change is massive. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned a couple of people that you worked with early on that were quite influential. Were there any other mentors or early influences that, helped you get started in real estate? Very much so. Um, I did my work experience back in 1977 with a guy called Jeffrey Sutherland. G.D. Sutherland is the name of his firm. He's in Agnes Street in East Melbourne. And uh, he, prior to that, he was a friend of my mum and dad's and he was one of the owners of Stockdale and Lego in the eastern suburbs. And um, then he set up, he sold out of that and set up his own and I did work experience with him and I found him fascinating and very motivating. And when I saw what he did, I liked what he did. And then as I grew up, I had two car dealers. I had uh, Neil Nielsen, who was a car dealer on one side of us as I grew up and Blanchard's uh, on the other side and they were in business. And so I decided, you know, I wanted to be in business and I wanted to be in the real estate business. So yes, and I saw Jeff Sutherland at a uh, Wingate lunch uh, very recently, and we had to talk as we went around the table what had inspired us. And I said, Jeffrey Sutherland, who's here today, gave me my first crack at real estate 40 years ago at work experience. And as a young kid, it certainly forms um, big impressions in your brain as to what you like and what you don't like. And, and he was a very positive influence on me. Okay. What was it about Jeffrey that you think had such an impact? He knew what he was doing. He uh, had a huge amount of horsepower and energy. Um, He was very factual. You couldn't roll him, and he would get the job done. So, you know, I remember vividly one afternoon, uh, Friday afternoon, he he got two calls to do two registered valuations down in Blair, Gary, and Rye. Um, And uh, he said, Paul, he said, be in the office uh, at 7.30 on uh, Monday morning. We'll go and do those. And I thought, oh, great probably drive down, have a counter lunch, and it'll be nice relaxing down to Blair, Gary and Rye. So I came in at 7.30 Monday morning, and he had already been down there, measured the house up from the outside, looked in through the windows, done the reports, and when I got in, we were on to the next thing, you know. And so, you know, he got everything done. And he he's claimed to fame, or what he was very good at, was uh, he got appointed really as the agent for Ferrier Hodson when Ferrier Hodson were liquidating Pyramid. And he uh, he was a very good operator. He's a very good auctioneer. And um, he, he generated uh, a lot of fees and he had a very big business in the early 90s. It was very interesting times, Daniel. Okay, we'll get on to the early 90s a little later on. But <clears throat> before we, we get to the your story of working in real estate in the early 90s. How did you come to set up your own firm, Castro and Gilbert? So um, in 1982 at Gull and Gilbert at 214 Blackburn Road, Sindel, still know it pretty well, um, Stuart Gull had decided he was a Ballarat boy. He decided to go back to Ballarat and um, Dennis, and he wanted to sell his share. It was a very small business, a very small little real estate business. And um, he decided uh, that he wanted to sell, and Dennis Gilbert uh, decided uh, that he would allow me to buy uh, Stuart's half share, so I bought it. My dad went guarantor for the money, but it was a humble amount. And Stuart took off to Ballarat, and I became Dennis Gilbert's partner. And um, the rest is history. We set up an office in uh, Burwood Highway, opposite Knox City. Uh, we set up one in Langhorn Street, Dandenong, and we set up another office in uh, 174 Warrandyte Road, Ringwood North, where all growth areas. Uh, in the 80s, and we grew a very large business. 
So were you always focused on luxury real estate or did that focus develop over time? No, it developed over time. And even to this day, uh, I sell luxury real estate, but we sell lots of projects. I sell, I've done land subdivisions, land auctions. Um, I do mortgagee sales, estates, um, feasibilities, um, top end development sites. And I would say that I have the expertise to handle stuff now in a 40 kilometre radius from Melbourne. In fact, later this year, I'm doing one in Hepburn Springs where um, the clients dealt with me for a long time and they just said, look, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sick of sending a boy on a man's errand, which is really nice, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to do one in Hepburn Springs. Um, and I did one more recently. I had a lovely client, lovely lady. She had a house and she said, look, I've got a house in Summers down on the uh, Ballerine Peninsula, not the Ballerine, the um, um, Mornington Peninsula. And um, she said, can you look after it? And I did. And we got a huge result and it sold very quickly. So, um, yeah, we, I, I cover everything. So what would be the most expensive property you've ever sold? I think it was about $15 million. Um, It was a big site over in uh, Williamstown um, along the foreshore there. And it used to be a wool press and it was several acres. And I sold it um, early 2000s. Um, and uh, it's since become a development site and a very successful development site for uh, a client of mine who's actually a client of yours. Yeah, I actually happen to live not too far from that uh, that work site, so I see see what's going on there. It's going up quite fast. Yeah. So you mentioned the early 1990s recession. Now, not many people remember what that recession was like. I had to look up some stats last night. <laughs> and I, Daniel, how old are you? Well, I was around. How was, old are I you? I was in primary school. Let's just put it that but, way. Uh, well, you, were more, in, you were more interested in who the, who the girls were at, uh, at lunchtime rather than whether your bank manager was going to be ringing you <laughs> during the day. Yes, that's, that's probably safe to say that. <laughs> so I had to look this up, but interest rates hit 17% in June 1989. So I saw that. I think, I think they hit a bit more because I did, did a they? printout. Yes, yeah, so I think 17.5% okay. 17. on the 23rd of January 1990. Okay, all right. Right, so they went even higher on the in January. They got to seventeen and a half percent, and I found that the unemployment rate reached a high of eleven point two percent in nineteen ninety one. That was the documented unemployment rate. You know, the undocumented unemployment rate and youth unemployment they believe was a lot higher. I'm sure it would have been. I'm sure it would have been. So, given such a horrible set of environment of economic circumstances. What was it like trying to sell property in the late 80s, early 90s? Hairy. That, that, that's how you describe it. So, so what happened was the market became illiquid and the only people that could buy were people with real money. And uh, values fell significantly and banks stopped lending. So it was like blood and guts on the street. It was, um, it was scary. So the run-up to this was that in 1987, on the 19th of October, do you know what happened on the 19th of October 1987, Daniel? That was, the, that was the crash. That was the big crash, exactly. And so there was a big stock market crash and um, uh, the policymakers shit themselves effectively here in Australia. Let's say it as it is. Mm -hmm. And um, they started dropping the interest rates and the, in the prevailing interest rates fell for memory to around 8%. Um, in the early 1988s and what that did was it fueled the real estate market and the real estate market from January 88 to December 88 doubled and and that was really scary because it was unsustainable again for the policy makers um, but they were trying to avoid a major recession after this um, mighty stock market crash and so they, they pulled the levers, as Paul Keating called them back in those days, have vivid memories of that. And he was the treasurer and talked about the Banana Republic. And he talked about the recession that we had to have. So property values doubled and banks weren't lending on cash flow as they are now. Banks were lending on asset values and banks were lending substantial amounts of money per asset. And of course, um, I remember vividly standing at number 60 or well, 62 Hopeton Road, where there was 43,560 square foot of land, which is a perfect acre, was owned by HBA. And they sold it in February 88 for 2 million, and it resold 
12 months later for four million. So that, and that was a serious amount of money back in those days. And so then the, the real estate market had escalated to a precarious level. And then um, we started heading into 1989 and Paul Keating was concerned. He was the federal treasurer. And these were um, uncharted waters and really no one knew what was happening. And then it was very late 1989, is my recollection, Pyramid Building Society rolled into receivership. And it was handed to Ferrier Hodson. So anyone who had money in, on term deposit and they were, they were paying the highest interest rates, their money was locked. So if you had your life savings tied up with Pyramid Building Society as they weren't a bank, um, your money was locked and it was locked for many years. And so then my partner and I, Dennis Gilbert, was selling real estate. Um, here's an example. Um, I remember we sold a property for a million dollars. We took a $100,000 deposit. It was a 90-day settlement. The day of settlement, we're getting ready to account the deposit. We got a letter from the purchaser's lawyer saying that the vendor was unable to give title. Please refund the deposit to the purchaser. And so what had happened is um, the debt on the property was $2 million and the loan was with Pyramid. So there was no way the property was going to settle. So um, I didn't collect my commission. Uh, the purchaser didn't buy the property and that property went into litigation and was later sold at mortgagee auction, probably by Jeff Sutherland, um, under instructions from Tony Hodson from Ferrier Hodson, who were the liquidators of the Pyramid Building Society. So. Um, you could sell properties back then and you didn't know whether they were going to settle and whether you were going to earn a fee. And they were hard to sell. Inquiry was very slim and um, people were negotiating very, very hard. So banks uh, weren't lending. Um, so it was really, it was really the survivors, you know, out there. And, um, you know, anyone who had the cash, real money, that bought property back then, they uh, had meteoric capital growth on it because that was really a low point. So that was um, that, that was a scary time. That was a really scary time. And I don't think anyone knows how scary it was unless you were actually in it. Were there any moments in which you thought, uh, this is it, my career in real estate might be over? Oh, many, many. Um, uh, you know, um, because I was holding a lot of real estate too. So um, I was, uh, what are, you know, walk the talk or whatever they say, you know, uh, you know I was in it and um, the bank revalued everything. So what, ha what would happen is the bank revalued everyone asset, everyone's assets and valued them down and said, you're in breach of your loan covenants and then charge you the higher interest rate. And so uh, back then at 17.5%, the banks were charging on bill rates uh, up to another 3% line fee. So you were paying 20 and a half percent. And um, I had a lot of commercial property, secondary commercial property back then, um, and uh, a substantial number, and every tenant bar one went broke. So not only was my interest bill escalating, my, rent, my revenue bill from the rents ceased, and the capital values halved. So if you were a prudent investor in 1988 and you were 50% geared, and um, um, you, you uh, had the properties 50% uh, geared in terms of mortgage, but they were plus revenue, they were positively geared in terms of the revenue side. By 1990, you were 100% geared and you were in default of all your covenants. So it was extreme. So you could have done everything right and then through the sheer magnitude of the market movements ended up in a very risky situation. Yeah, and I, I sold a house number, number one Angus Number one Angus uh, Avenue, Mount Wa Glen Waverley, and um, it was 69.950. And I said, "Did you need that subject to uh, a loan, Walt?" And he said, "No, no, no." He said, "Paul," he said, "he was an, an older guy." He said, "I pay cash," and I said, "Really, Walt?" I said, "Look, if you've got seventy thousand cash, let's divide it into three, put twenty odd thousand dollars deposit down, and buy three of these houses." He said, "Paul." He said, I was a product of the Depression and I was brought up and I'm a potato farmer from Cooey Rupp and I was taught if you couldn't afford to buy it, he said, you don't have it. And I thought Wal Elliott was an idiot. 
But in 1990, I thought he was a very smart guy <laughs> because he was the guy standing there with his title in his bottom drawer with no mortgage. And uh, he was probably taking holidays and enjoying himself and he was free of worry. So what do you think were the key lessons? You kind of hinted at some of them, but what do you think were the key lessons for you that you learned during that period, both about property and investing, but also running a business? Yes. Um, crystal clear, my, um, my property portfolio was um, very, very heavy on secondary strip centre uh, shops. And uh, so the first thing I would say to anyone setting up a portfolio is nothing performs the same at the same time and uh, things are all different. Um, don't be heavy in any one particular area. So I learned, uh, you know, that had I had uh, more diversification, that would have been a good thing because I was in the area where I, they were all shot down. Um, so I learned that. The, the next thing uh, I would say to you is deal with, um, never deal with one bank deal with two or more banks, maybe even three, but don't even tell them, don't even tell the banks what you've got. Just just tell them enough to get what you need and remain silent. Um, don't fill out your asset and liability uh, sheets um, and put everything on it because a personal guarantee means that they can come and take the sunglasses off your head, Daniel, because if you really want it, they can come and take your watch off you, they can drive your car away. Um, Personal guarantees um, are a very frightening thing if you don't understand exactly what they are. Glenn Wheatley wrote a book called Paper Paradise and it's the book starts with him going up the lift at uh, 500, 500 Burke Street and the doors opening and going into Ferrier Hodson's office and the guy, the first thing he said was, I want Gaynor's uh, Cartier watch. And he said, that was a present for the birth of my first child. And he said, well, you've signed a personal guarantee and that extends to everything. So watch personal guarantees, maybe get limited personal guarantees. Um, give the bank only enough information that's required. It's a game. It's a game out there dealing with the banks. The banks want to get the maximum security. They want to get a registered mortgage debenture. They want to get a first mortgage. They want to get a personal guarantee. They're greedy bastards. They want to get all this security. And at the sport is, as a borrower, you want to give them nothing. You don't want to give them a personal guarantee. Uh, you just want to give them the minimum to get the borrowings that you want. So that's the game that you've got to play. The next thing is if you're running a business, again, um, be very careful with the banks. Uh, make sure that you're not uh, overgeared. And even back then, which was probably one of the keys, we kept out uh, quite a large sum of money as a rainy day money. We always had the, the run to money, the, the money under the mattress. It wasn't under the mattress, it was in a different bank, just sitting in term deposit. And if we hadn't had that, we would have gone to the wall because the banks had stopped lending. So diversify your portfolio, keep cash out separately and play the game with the banks as hard as they play it with you. Sometimes you need a good lawyer to have a look at the mortgage documents and to vet it all and um, kiss your wife and hug her every night and make sure that your marriage stays together because if she runs off uh, in this time, it's catastrophic because that's the last thing you want is caveats on the title of all the assets that are, that are shoring up the business. So my beautiful wife's been with me for 28 years and so she was a great asset. That's a, I think that's some very good advice, particularly the the last part about having a happy marriage because uh, I used to see that in London with a lot of the the old traders on the uh, trading desks. Many of them were there years longer than they wanted to be on the desk simply because they'd been through a couple of divorces. Yeah, it's geometric. You, you understand when I say geometric. You know, when you when you plot a graph, you know, it's not lineal. It's geometric. So you have one wife, you lose half. You, you have another wife, you lose half of a half and you do it again. You lose half of a half of a half and that means you're left with a poofteenth. And all they do is history repeats itself every time and they're no happier. And they move to their second wife, they're no happier that the same problems exist and they move to their third wife and all they do is sit there on the trading desk killing themselves. So, yes, look after your health, look after your physical health, look after your mental health, be aware of what's going on, have a relationship with your wife and enjoy your life because you don't get a second crack. 
So I, I started out asking for property advice. We've got relationship advice yeah. too. It's a two for one deal. <laughs> no extra charge, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think do you think people have forgotten the lessons of this period? People out there buying and selling today is is the chance that something like this may may happen again anywhere in their consciousness? No. Well, let me qualify. I'm 58, so people my vintage and older, they understand it. Um, my son's 26. He has no clue. He wasn't even born. He was born in 1992 and my daughter in 94. They weren't even born. So th this is um, stuff that you look at in the encyclopedia or Google and no, they, they honestly don't comprehend it. So we'll move on to some questions on property prices and valuations. Sure. We'll tap that valuation expertise that you've honed over many, many years. Is there such a thing as the property market or is every house different? It's a good question, the property market. And I look at some of the articles that are written and some of them talk about the property market in Australia and some of them talk about it, the property market in Victoria. Some of them then go down, say, in Melbourne, and then some of them might say in South Yarra or Toorak or, or pick a suburb. Now, in my opinion, the statistics that come out from the property market in global Australia, if you want to put it that, they're pouring all the real estate into a vitamizer, pushing the blend button and pouring it into a glass. That's a load of rubbish because Perth has underperformed, Brisbane has underperformed, South Australia has underperformed, um, while Sydney and Melbourne have over outperformed. Um, and so you, uh, every property is really different, but there are similarities in sectors. For instance, um, it might be inner suburban, outer suburban. So you might, you know, rule a line five kilometres from the CBD, inner suburban. Um, there's similarities uh, with, say, uh, offices. So we're talking, you know, rates per square metre to lease offices and capitalisation rates. We might be talking industrial. Um, whether we're talking out in like William Anglis side over in Laverton or whether we're talking Dandenong, um, you might be talking top end Turak, you might be talking flats, uh, you might be talking uh, individual titles. And so they're all different. They, they are definitely all different. You, you cannot um, really just take one of these generic statistics that the journalists that are looking to sell newspapers, and remember that, Daniel, um, I've had many arguments with the editor of The Age and they cannot sell good news stories. They can only sell tragedy stories. So they pluck these statistics that are meaningless statistics and attach a, a terrifying headline to, to grab attention to sell advertising space because that's their motivation. So um, you've got to look at each property individually is my opinion. With that in mind, what are the key drivers of a house's price or valuation? The number, one, the number one key driver is the availability or the scarcity. And so if you have something that doesn't exist, pretty much in any market, you'll get, you'll get a good result. So when I say that, um, maybe you're down in Mool Avenue in Brighton and you've got a water frontage property with a 300 uh, or a 100 metre frontage on the beach uh, maybe you're in Portsea on the cliff with access straight down to the beach. This is a finite number. The, these are a finite number and there are always more buyers in any market than there are sellers. And so that will prop the value of that property. And then following on from that, the more available uh, a property is, the less likely is the growth. And so therefore, um, that's the one that's not going to fare very well. So if you've got something that there is a lot of it, the pro it, it here's the analogy. The farmers have a great season. The uh, weather is kind. There's no hail. And every tomato grower grows beautiful, plump tomatoes. And they take them to the market. And every farmer has had the same conditions and they take theirs to the market and all of a sudden the prices of tomatoes plummet. And these tomato growers can't take the tomatoes home and say, well, I'll come back in two years' time and sell the tomatoes because they're perishable. And of course, everyone will remember, um, look, maybe it was a year or two ago, 
the extreme weather conditions they had in far north Queensland destroyed all the bananas. And the that. price of bananas <clears throat> went through the roof. You know, it was like a luxury to eat a banana because of scarcity and property is identical. So you've got to look for something that's got attributes that can't be duplicated. That, that is one of the key ingredients. So following on from your logic then, those sorts of rare properties with specific attributes probably don't become available all the time. Does that mean then that no price is too high for something like that when it is available to buy it? Because you you can count on the fact that restricted supply will always yeah. lead to a higher value? Correct. So uh, here's another analogy. In the Chinese world, number eight is good. In the Chinese world, number four is bad. Four means death. 44 means double death. Simon's, you know, I'll save you. You know, the Aussie home loans man that sold out the Commonwealth Bank, he had number plate number four in New South Wales and he sold it for 2.4 million. So obviously a Chinese buyer didn't buy it, or maybe they did, but the point about it is it's a limited commodity. So um, I know the guy who owns the number plate number one and number two here in Melbourne and the guy at num- the, who owns the number plate number one, he says it's unique and there is only one of it. And I say, yes, but my number plate, which is a generic number plate, is unique also because every number plate has to be unique. But his has got number one on it and there is only number one number one plate. And so therefore, it, you, there's lots of people that would like to own it. And when you've got lots of people that would like to own something that's in very short supply, price, the same as bananas. Yeah. The prices go up. You've got something that everybody's got, prices go down. So it sounds like supply and demand are the key drivers of property prices. And one of them, one definitely, of them. yes. Are there any others? Very much so. So um, supply and demand, it's the supply and demand forces. So the things that, that affect property values are, um, and, and there's many of them, obviously how many of them there are, supply, and, and what drives, so, so what are the drivers of supply and what are the drivers of demand? And so if on the supply side you can't duplicate it because it doesn't exist, for instance, it's water frontage or um, it, it has a, a superior view, a city view, or uh, it's of a size that can't be replicated, then the supply side of things is very restricted. So then on the, on the demand side, what drives it? Interest rates are a driver because the cheaper the interest rates, the cheaper the loan repayments. Liquidity with the banks, very important. We're seeing very much a different ball game at the moment with the bank. When the banks are lending freely, um, uh, th- those, those liquidity episodes will drive asset prices up. Um, the other thing that has a huge impact is um, what's going on in the economy, you know, unemployment. So if unemployment is high and people haven't got jobs, they can't afford mortgages because the whole market is a ripple effect. So the whole market, the top end generally is pushed by the stepping stone of the first home buyer into the second, the second home buyer into the third, the third home buyer into the fourth. And, you know, people, Melbourne's a radial city with the CBD in the middle and you've got the peripheral suburbs, Cranbourne, Pakenham, Sittenham, Epping, right out there. And generally, if people work in the city, they're trying to move closer in. So they might buy a house, stay for five years, sell it, move in to Mount Waverley, on the eastern suburbs, sell it, move into Glen Iris, you know, five years later, sell it, maybe move into Armadale and then sell it and move into Turak. So there's this ripple effect. And so what causes the stimulation at the low end, uh, interest rates, bank liquidity, any uh, first homeowners grants, reduction in stamp duty grants that the federal and state government might offer, and then also what's happening with the dollar. So our dollar's been up to a dollar ten or a dollar nine more recently, and it's been as low as forty eight cents. And so if our dollar drops, which that's what they're predicting at the moment, it's hovering around seventy u s cents. Um, but the economic commentary is that maybe the dollar will fall, the reserve bank want it down to sixty five or lower. Um, we start to become attractive to all those people that are working in London, Hong Kong, Singapore, New York, who are all stockbrokers or fund managers or absolute fund managers, or um, they might receive bonuses where they're all being paid in US dollars. Well, here's an example. I had a guy, I sold him a house in, um, in Armadale in a beautiful street, 
and um, he received, he, he was working in Hong Kong, he received a one million US bonus. And the day that he brought his one million US dollars into Australia was the, the low point, it was 48 cents. So his one million US became two million Australian. So you can see that um, as our dollar drops, we become uh, not only for expats working, but Chinese. And of course, there's a lot of Chinese around wanting to buy. Um, we're the uh, second or third hottest destination in the world for them to buy. So that's another very big driver. So, you know, there's, there's grants, there's interest rates, supply, um, the dollar, um, employment, and the general economic condition at the time that gives people confidence. Because when there's confidence in a market, the market will run. When the confidence is ripped out from underneath people, they're not so keen to go out and buy. They'll stick their money in the bank or under the mattress and sit and watch. Just on that point of confidence, how long did it take for it to come back after the early 90s? Slowly, slowly. It probably took um, five years for the confidence to come back because the interest rates got slashed. You know, I've got the printout here. You know, the interest rates came down a lot, but it took probably five years. So we know that most houses are valued using comparable sales. Yes. When might you use other methods like a rental yield or replacement value? Uh, maybe, uh, well, replacement value is used for insurance purposes. So um, always check your insurance and make sure you're insured because um, that's, one of the great, that's one of the great problems is the thing. Do you know what averaging is, Daniel? No. Okay, so if let's suppose you've got a house and... Um, the house, the cost to replace the house, not the land, just to replace if there was a fire. Let's suppose the cost to replace a house was a million dollars. And um, you, you insured your house for 500000 and it burnt to the ground. The insurance company would come in and they would say, um, this house will cost a million dollars to replace. You've only insured for 500000 so you've only insured half the value. So what they'll do is they'll say, well, you're insur you're, you've been paying a premium on 500,000, so we'll only pay you half, we'll pay 250. So if your house burnt down, they would, under the averaging provision, and it's nearly in every policy, you would only get a payout from the insurance company of 250,000, which is a quarter, because it's a half of a half. So um, on those ones, replacement value, uh, very important, for your insurance because otherwise you only have insurance in, a, in the event of a catastrophe and you should have insurance for all your planning permits and uh, architectural permits and lead time and alternative accommodation uh, so that you're covered. So they tend to be for insurance or something that might be brand new where someone's just built it and they're trying to get a handle on the value. A capitalisation uh, method might be on something uh, like a block of flats where you can value them individually. It depends whether they're strated and individual or whether it's all on one title. There might be 12 apartments on one title. Um, and those will get sold often um, on a market rent. The, the capitalisation rate might be around 3 or 4%. Um, so it, it depends on the property. But on a residential house, a typical residential house that most people live in, the most frequent um, way of valuing is on comparable sales. One sold in the next street, one sold next door. It was on similar land size. It was three bedrooms, two bathrooms, double lock-up garage. It was built in 1928, the same as yours, and the condition was pretty similar. That sold for a million. Yours is going to be worth circle a million. So when you're looking for comparable sales, obviously no two houses are the same. What would be the key things you're trying to match up? Well... It all, falls very, it all falls very simply. It goes suburb, price, accommodation. People either read the paper or go on the internet. The first thing they have to type in is a suburb. So it's A to Z, you know, pick a suburb, Armadale. <laughs> the next thing they usually put in is number of bedrooms, isn't it? So they go, I need three bedrooms, four bedrooms or whatever it is. And then they'll put in whether they need bathrooms and car. And then, then they see what the price is. So it's suburb, um, suburb accommodation price is the logic of how it falls. So 
Um, I've had many a developer sit in my office and they talk about building new apartments and they say to me, Paul, I'm going to build these fabulous one bedroom apartments that are going to be 60 square metres, big ones, and we're going to kill the market. I say, yes, righto. So I say to them, if I had a one bedroom apartment that was 60 square metres and I had a two bedroom apartment that was 60 square metres, which one costs the most to build? And they look at me trying to work out what the trick question is. And they say to me, if they're smart enough, they say, it's going to cost the same to build because it's 60 square metres. I say, very good. So I said, if we were putting it on realestate.com and it was Armadale, we'll just use Armadale because it's the letter A, and the ad said, two bedroom apartment, 60 square metres, and then we put another listing up, Armadale, one bedroom apartment, 60 square metres. You tell me, Daniel, which one do you think is going to sell for more? I think the two. I think you're right. I say this to my developers, when you go to the butcher and you're buying meat, the unit price of meat is kilograms. So whatever type of meat you're buying, you pay per kilogram. And when you go to the service station and you fill up with petrol, the unit is litres. And so with real estate, generally, the unit is bedrooms. Now, it, it's not always the case, but generally, that's how people search it. They say, I've got a family with three kids or two kids or whatever it is. So that's, that's generally how it runs. And then the other things then start to come in. The size of the land, can you demolish it? Is there a heritage overlay? It can't be demolished. Uh, then the buyer might be a tradesman and um, he's had his uh, tools pinched out of his car, parked on the street six times and he doesn't really care about the house. He cares about having a lock-up garage because every time he goes out in the morning his tools have been pinched. Might be someone who's um, going to be practising from home and they want a little side entrance and they want to be able to practise from home. Um, it might be someone who has uh, their in-laws living with them and they need a ground floor bedroom with a bathroom. There's a whole range of criteria because no one's the same that registers for them and they're the things that follow in after that. But generally bedrooms and the land size and whether you can demolish it or not. So following on from that prescription of suburb, land size, price and any restrictions on development. We've seen some of the real estate websites actually now have algorithms that will price up your house for you. Do they work? Do they, and I'm guessing they would follow a similar formula. Yes, um, it's a very good question. And um, I've, I use two of them. I use one, I use realestate.com and I use domain and I use it as a check really. And uh, in the office, I actually generally go out with two of us when we go and value something. I've done this for 38 years and I'll walk through the property and I'll write my figure on a card, a business card out the front and not show my partner. And then he'll write his and then we'll show each other like snap, you know, Shazam, let's have a look at the figures. And we, we reconcile between ourselves. Because the interesting thing, the algorithm um, from the platforms can be very accurate and it can be very inaccurate. So for example, um, where I live, on my house, uh, I went in and had a look at it. Um, we always start with our own house. Don't you? Every, like, you know, <laughs> everyone does that. Um, so see, the interesting thing is I demolished my house and rebuilt a new house and it hasn't been sold for 20 years or more. And so um, they go off the last sale and they don't, no one's been through or there's no photos because every time you sell or rent a house, all that information is collated into these sites. And they, so um, the, the answer is they will become more accurate in time. So if we were sitting here in 50 years' time and pretty much every property in Melbourne's been transacted several times and it's got all the land size and all the photographs and all the data in it, they will become more accurate. But there are, inaccuracies at the moment. So if I was uh, looking at one uh, as an example in Bentley, and it was a Californian bungalow, three bedroom, you know, built in the 20s. And, um, you know, because a lot of the streets in Bentley are quite similar. And that was the era that it was settled, like Mount Waverley was settled in the 60s and a triple fronted cream brick veneer with a terracotta roof and aluminium window frames, sold plenty of those. Um, the algorithm's quite accurate on that because the, when the land was subdivided, all the blocks were 50 by 150 
back then, 7,500 foot, 700 square metres. Um, so the land size was very similar and they were building the same. A lot of the Victorian terraces, uh, whether you're going into East Melbourne or Fitzroy or even South Yarra, if they're uh, you know single fronted, two bedroom uh, Victorian terraces, they'll be accurate, but they're not always accurate. So that's like diagnosing yourself with a serious illness on Google using the medical diagnosis uh, for Google and you know you get something wrong with you and you think oh shit I'm buddy I've got cancer or I'm having a heart attack or something like that and then you go to the doctor and the years of experience of the doctor says no 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 you've just got indigestion um, you know you've had too much red wine just relax you'll be okay so it's a good question um, and they will become more accurate, and sometimes they are, but sometimes they are inaccurate. So be careful. Okay. So council valuations. We all get our rate notices. Yep. There's valuations on those, and we often hear that oh, council valuations are too conservative. Are they any guide to what a property might be worth? No. So it's it's also, I, I always joke and I, I say, well, uh, would you sell your house for what the council values it at? And on the council, because usually they run at two and four year cycles, um, and it'll have three figures on it. It'll have CIV, which stands for Capital Improved Value, which means the house as it stands. It'll have Site Value, which is assuming there is no house on the land, just vacant land. And it'll have NAV, which is the rent, what is, they assess the annual rent. And the whole... That the interesting thing is this, is that council valuations are there to collect revenue for the councils because they clip the ticket of that valuation to generate revenue to balance their books, to collect garbage, to run uh, um, uh, you know, centres for infants, meals on wheels, um, uh, all of that sort of thing. So... They don't want to run them too high. And, of course, where they're under fire at the moment, um, state government, write a letter, write a letter to your, your local politician, land tax, because the site value on your council notice is the figure that's uh, imputed into the calculation of the land tax. So the boys at the state government won't work out how many hundreds of billions of dollars they want to generate from land tax, and that all stems, they put an equalising factor, it all stems from site value on your on your rates notice. So it's the whole thing about that, no, it's not what you'd sell it for, it's not what you'd rent it for. They are not uh, market values, they are figures set to collect revenue. It sounds like they're working backwards where they're figuring out we need to collect, say, $100 million worth of revenue. We have so many houses in our council area divide 100 million by the number of houses that's roughly what they're worth it would be so easy for them there because they would have the numbers right there and they know what revenue because that's how they generate their revenue parking fines and rates is generally how they they uh, generate their revenue and they're pretty bloody good on both of them <laughs> it would be a very interesting exercise to sit there with their laptop and see if they tweaked it just a fraction how much more they could generate mm -hmm. so i am um, um, I got a big land tax bill on some stuff that I own and I challenged the council, a guy that uh, I've been helping him do the valuations for the last 30 years and um, I beat him. So um, he, was, he was happy to roll over and it had a significant impact on the land tax. So um, don't be afraid to challenge them uh, with the council if uh, you think they're not right. Okay, very interesting. So my wife loves to watch the lifestyle TV programs where you see people buying houses in the US and flipping them. Well, you've got a big problem, haven't you, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> I do, yes. Well, at the moment, we've got uh, one child and one on the way, so we won't Excellent. be flipping anything at the moment. But one of the things I've noticed watching those shows is that there seems to be a, a rough formula to a flip in the US, and it, it works something like this, uh, rough numbers, of course. They'll buy an old house somewhere in the Midwest for $100,000. They'll spend 100000 fixing it up, and then they'll sell it for three hundred. So there's roughly this third, a third, a third. Yep. Third to buy, third to yep. fix, third margin. And when I look at properties for sale um, in Australia and, and where I live, and there are some suburbs not far from where I live where you could buy the block and perhaps knock down the house and, and put a duplex on it or something like that, there's no way I can get anywhere near 
that sort of a third, a third, a third ratio. It's almost two thirds to buy the property. And uh, you'd probably be lu lucky if you're left with sort of five to 10% margin after you put the build cost on. So I guess my question, it's a long winded question is, how does anybody make money flipping in Australia? When there's a severe market correction, um, but not, not on a general market because the in and outs costs are too heavy. I mean, stamp duty over a million dollars is uh, 5%, 5.5%. Um, agents fees, you know, might range from 1% to 3% depending on what you're doing. Solicitors fees. At the moment in the construction industry, you can't get trades. So, uh, you know, that's uh, all the prices are very inflated on all of that. And the answer is you can't. And a lot of the developers are finding that right now. Their margins are being cramped. You know, their uh, the jobs are run a bit longer. The interest rates run a bit higher. Uh, the marketing costs run a bit longer, a bit harder to sell, having to drop the prices a little bit. Um, and the answer is they can't. And those lifestyle properties that you're watching, that came out of what was 2008, which was the global financial crisis. And I've got friends of mine that that's what they do. They've been, they've been over there since 2007 buying distressed assets because there were some areas in Detroit where they demolished the whole suburbs. You know, um, Fannie Mae and, and all these, uh, the big short, if you've seen the movie, Fannie Mae and all these um, um, mortgage lenders, uh, they have what's called a non-recourse loan in America where if you bought a house for $200,000 and you borrowed 160000 and you defaulted under the payments, you can choose just to hand the keys in and walk away and they won't come and sue you personally and so you've ripped up 40000 well, that's what happens in America, and there were suburbs and, and whole regions, and and that was, and of course the banks stopped lending, there was no liquidity, and so if um, you go back and do your numbers, if all of a sudden those properties that you're looking at halved in value, and then you were going to do it, you'd go, hmm, I can see it, but you see, if you bought it now, you're buying in a, if you were buying it, or if you bought it in a depressed market, you're not going to be able to retail it. You've got to renovate it and hold it or rent it out for a year or two for it to come good, then renovate it and sell it. So very hard to do the flip in the same market. Very hard. That's, a, that's an interesting observation because some of the ones I see near where I live, for example, uh, you're, you're paying over a million dollars for a knockdown. Yeah. And then by the time you're putting two... Uh, Two houses on it, you're probably spending five or six hundred. Yeah, and then you're trying to sell them for just over a million each. Um, which, by the time you take your funding costs and your approval costs and your transaction costs out of it, and GST on the new construction, GST. doesn't seem like you're making that much, given that you're taking what could be up to two years worth of risk before you get your money out. Correct. Of it. So the best way is to buy a house that you live in, because it's the only asset you get tax free. So if it's your principal place of residence, you don't pay land tax on it. You get the pleasure of living in it. And when you sell it, you don't pay one cent in, in capital gains tax at the moment. So let's bust a few property myths now. Myth busters. First property myth, foreign buyers. What's the true story there? There's few, that, look, there's, there's less of them today. So here's the truth about offshore buyers. From... 2009 and then running through early 10, 11, 12, the number of buyers coming from China accelerated. They were coming out here um, on and trying to obtain what's called an SIG, uh, 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 an SIV, a significant investment visa, and that cost them $5 million. They had to invest $5 million. And um, I was selling a lot of stuff uh, to these guys that were coming out, and that they were they are buying because they want to get money out of China, because um, they want a lifestyle in Australia, the education, the clean air, um, and it, this is the number two destination. California is the number one destination. They sold over a hundred billion, hundred billion uh, worth of property in California. Canada used to be the second one, and. They've shut the doors. Canada shut the door on the Chinese buying there, effectively, um, and so now. So, but what the policymakers have done is they've doubled the stamp duty, they've doubled the land tax, and they've put a whole lot of conditions, and so they've made it uh, less palatable for non 
residents or offshore buyers to come and buy it. That's not to say that they're still not around. They are definitely still around, but a lot less of them. I'll give you an example, a client of yours and a client of mine that we both know. Um, I sold his house and um, uh, we had lots of Chinese through and and while I was doing the open for inspections, taxis used to pull up and minivans and, and six, seven, eight of them would get out at one time. They'd leave the engine running. There'd be one of them could speak English and they'd all come in and talk about the property. Um, I would email a contract and get all the details from the person that spoke English. Um, They all had specific emails at QQ, you know, um, they all have different um, uh, domains uh, over there. And then you you were really in the hands of the gods coming to the auction. And then sometimes they'd turn up and sometimes they wouldn't. And in this particular case, I mean, there was many of them, they did. They turned up very relaxed and they bought it. Um, And they go, oh, we're going to buy it in our son's name. Where's he? Oh, he's playing basketball. How old's your son? Oh, he's 18. I think, thank goodness, you know, he's he's old enough. So um, I had to put a salesman in the car and get the salesman to drive where the son was playing basketball, which was 10 k's away. I said, have you got your checkbook here? No. Where's that? Well, I had to put a salesman in a car, get the checkbook, and we waited two hours for them all to come back and sign up because they don't care, you know. So they bought it. It was a thing. So the interesting thing is uh, in in those years of 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, the buyers again started to spook the policymakers and they could see that there was too many of them buying and they were ramping up the prices. They definitely were. Prices where they were competing and they were buying all the top-end stuff. So they've made it a lot harder. And there is probably... 10% of them uh, hanging around now because the costs of holding and the costs of stamp duty is 12%. It's a lot more difficult. So that's what's happening now. You've got to remember if our dollar falls to 65 or 60 or even below, they all trade in US dollars. So they might come back again. This is probably my favourite myth on the list of myths, and that's auction strategy. We hear so many different things like go in hard with your your best bid first, and then you have a lot of other people say hang back and try and sneak it in at the end once the bidding's exhausted. What do you think is the best auction strategy? Okay, so let's turn it around the other way. I'm an auctioneer, and I've done many thousands of auctions. And the hardest thing when I'm doing an auction is silence. So um, when I've got someone at an auction asking questions, trying to disrupt the auction, what about this, what about that? I always say to them, good question. And I'll repeat the question and say it out as loud as I can so that all the audience can hear it. And then I'll then say to the person, I'll answer the question as best I can answer it. And then I will always qualify that and I will say, are you happy with my answer? And they'll give me an answer. And I said, but but please, if that is insufficient for you, do not bid because I don't want you to buy something that you are confused, unsure or not happy about. And that usually slows them up. So you visualise this, Daniel. And so then... If I'm an auctioneer, I've got a vendor inside who has got a number in their head and an expectation, and I've got people outside who are trying to buy it as cheap as they can, because that's just normal human nature. And, you know, I'll be six foot under and in a hundred years time, nothing will change. Vendors will always want above the market and buyers are always going to want to buy below the market. So I think if no one bids or if people have one bid and then go silent, that's much harder for an auctioneer. When you've got someone, and let, let's suppose we're selling a property and um, the vendor wants a million dollars, and I go, uh, who'd like to start the bidding? Uh, can we see a start of 900? And someone yells out, 900! Thank you, sir, at 900, take a rise of $25,000. For those who like to get on at the moment, 900 with the bidder there. And then someone else goes, 925! I go, your fresh bidding at 925 against you, sir, 50 if you want to get on, otherwise it's his. And then if people are looking at me and dancing with me, it's much easier for me because I'll ramp one against the other. And then as they come in, I will say two bidders, three bidders, because the people that are sitting there wanting to bid, their hearts pumping and their guts are churning. 
and they're thinking, oh, my God, there's six people here bidding now, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, some people think, shit, I better hurry up and have a bid, otherwise it's going to go so so high, I'm never even going to get a chance, you know. So, you know, 990, a million now, you've missed out, so, you know. And and so here's an interesting one. I went to an auction. So, so the answer is you've got to be a bit fatalistic. You've got to be in the price range that you think it's going to sell for. Because if um, you've got nine hundred thousand dollars to spend and you're looking at properties for one point two million, you're never going to buy. So you've got to be in the price range. So then I went to an auction on Saturday, and um, I was I was interested in it for a client, and the auctioneer was tense. Read the body language on the auctioneer because when the auctioneer knows he's got plenty of bidders, he's a lot more relaxed, and you can't hide your body language. And he started, he, he tried to start the auction. Of course, no one started the auction. And then he started the auction on a vendor bid at 1.4 million. That's always got to be a bad sign, isn't it? Yes. Well, not, all, not always, but mostly. So 1.4, and then he was really struggling. And then um, a guy said, I'll give you 5,000, 1 million 405. He said, What about 10? And the guy said, All right, 1 million 410. So then he went back to his spiel and he was under pressure and he was getting nowhere. And so he said, which was amazing, he said, I'm going to put a vendor bid in at 1,480. And I thought, wow. So if I was the guy there bidding, I would have said nothing. But he then bid at 1,490 against himself and against a vendor bid. There was no one else bidding. Then there was another guy started bidding, which... I'm not so sure about, but that's just my opinion. And there was a flurry between these two up to 1,550. When the auctioneer said, it's on the market, the other guy immediately stopped and this guy then bought it. And so I walked away and I thought, you, you, this, this is a very serious, it can be a very serious problem because the fines for dummy bidders now are a quarter of a million dollars. So um, I was just unsure about the validity of this, and I could be wrong, but it just didn't have that right smell to it. So uh, current market, bidders are thin on the ground, and you're out there, you're wanting to buy now, wait for the auctioneer to say it's on the market. Do they have to clearly state that? Yeah, if, if they're going to sell it. So, the, in, Can you ask? Yes, and um, that's a good sign. So if I'm, if I'm the auctioneer... And, um, you know, we've taken a few bids and then a fresh party says, is it on the market, Paul? Why do you think he's asking me that? Because he's keen. He's keen. <clears throat> so I think beauty. I, and uh, if it isn't, um, I might say to him, not just yet, but very, very close, sir, would you like to bid? And at which point they'll either say yes or no. And so the job is to nurse them up to the figure at which it is on the market, the vendor will sell it. So, yes, you can ask, and um, the auctioneer really has to answer that. He has to say, is it on the market? So when I'm doing an auction, um, I'm running the auction, and when I get to the price that the vendor will sell, um, I say, it's on the market, and I will sell it to that gentleman right there. I'm going to give you all one last chance. You open the bidding up again, and uh, you see what's there, and if there's no other bid, the contract comes down and the property is sold. But the more bidders, the more questions, the more agitation, the more comfortable I'm feeling as an auctioneer. When it's cold and there's few people there and no one starts the auction, you're thinking, and it starts raining, you think, beautiful, I'm here, no one else, I might be able to steal it today because I'm aware that the vendor that's selling has bought another property and if they don't sell today, they're going to be paying bridging finance. Always a good question to ask. They've bought another house. So they're, they're, they're a seller. They're going to meet the market today. It's a bit like when someone says to you, Daniel, they say, um, can you sell my Commonwealth Bank shares for $100? And you go, well, no, Paul. Um, they're trading at $71 today. I can sell them for that. Uh, give me a call when they hit 100. So when you hit market, and sometimes the market uh, can be a bit lower than the vendor's expectation, um, it'll sell. There we are. It's funny, your comments about questions and banter, 
and even sometimes people perhaps disagreeing with you remind me of a, an Italian saying that my parents used to tell me it's chi disprezza compra which translates roughly to he who criticizes buys yes yes well you got to remember unless people are sado masochists what are they even doing going to auctions you know and then if they're asking questions you know like um, they've got an interest you, you know I mean uh, once people have bought they tend not to go to auctions so much because it's a chore you know, um, yes, the people are interested, but you see the same ones out every weekend, you know, because they've uh, sold their house and they've got to buy. Yep. You know, they're on a mission. They're having another child. They need another bedroom. They're <laughs> moving into state. They're transferred with their job, you know, whatever. So in terms of getting the auction started, this is a question I've always wondered as well. The auction bidding process will usually start below the vendor's reserve. Yeah. How do you go about figuring out how much below? Is it a standard 10%, 20%? No, no, no. It's really an arbitrary thing. It's got to be. So let, let's say the vendor wants a million dollars and let's say we've got three people that are interested and, and we believe they might be paying, they've sort of indicated maybe around 950 is where their limit is. Remember, all buyers are liars. So... Um, if they're telling you 950, I would expect that maybe they've got a million and bingo, we've hit the number. But then you want participation and you want involvement and you want to see what's out there. And even if someone's bidding and they can only afford 950 and they're not going to buy it, it's nice to have a bit more participation because that puts pressure on the buyer that does want to buy it. So if there's five or six bidders, but four of them drop out, you know, below that puts ultimately a, a lot of pressure because that the, the ultimate buyer doesn't know whether they're going to start bidding again so what what I like to do is just start it at a reasonable figure that, that's within Kui and I make that assessment because the thing is as the auctioneer I can take whatever bid I want and and I've seen a lot of auctioneers that I think are ineffective because they get so fixed on their... So they'll say, at 900000 we start the bidding at nine. dollars Thank you, sir, for the bid of nine hundred. Take a $25,000 rise. And it all sort of goes quiet. I'm looking for twenty five, and someone will go, I'll give you 5000 No, sir, I'm taking twenty five at the moment. I've never understood why they do that. He's got nothing else there. He's working for the vendor. You've got to create inertia. So if that was me and I've got someone started at 900 and someone goes five, I'd say, I'd really like the 25, but I'll take your five today at 905, sir. You want to come straight back at 930 and go back to my opening bidder? And then quite often on those auctions, I'll be going 930 and five from you. Yes, my $5,000 man at 935, sir. You want to crank it up to 950 and then 955, 970 and then 975. I'm saying, sir, and I come back to them, I say, sir, I don't think the fives are working quite well enough for you at the moment. What about the intimidatory bid? What about the knockout bid of a million dollars now and be done and let's transact? And sort of, you know, I put it on them. Mm -hmm. And so... But what I like to do is keep the inertia of the auction because by refusing someone's money, he's like sucking the air. That, that's it? right. He's there. He's bidding. So take his money and let's have a bit of fun and uh, let's see what's there. And water will find its own level, level Daniel. Um, so, yes, take the money. Take the bid. So still keeping with this theme of auctions, there's a lot of discussion in the media about auction and sale results being fudged. You know, they're self-reported by agents, properties being passed in and then getting counted as auction sales. Is that true? Can we yes. trust the numbers? No, you can't okay. trust the numbers. You, if you have a look now, realestate.com put on it, um, let's suppose it might be 700 auctions and it's a 58% clearance rate. But of the 700 auctions that were gazetted for that weekend, only 500 are reported. So the percentage that's being reported of a 58% clearance is based on 500 auction sales. So what's happened to the other 200? Probably vendor bid or passed in or no action, so not reported. So if they were put into the mix, the statistic might be 30 or 35 or 40% clearance rate. So, uh, very good question, and I look at it, and uh, and I've known over the years from some of my competitors that they were doing this. They actually ran a campaign using um, the age auction results 
as the statistic of their selling ability. And if they didn't sell it on the weekend and they sold it the following weekend, they'd report it as sold the following weekend. They don't. They won't allow you to do that now under the op-ed. 10, 15, 20 years ago you could do so and they were selling properties at private sale and they were quoting them as sold at auction (laughs) and so then they said as reported in the age auction results from the period of this to this, this particular company had sold and so therefore it was all of course premeditated, pre-cocked up bloody statistics for the motivation of having power within a market. Yeah, that's a, that's, I think if you got on the phone and rang the agents and found out those other 200 that weren't reported, they'd probably almost certainly be passed in. <laughs> and so the uh, auction results are uh, not quite accurate. Okay. So next myth, gentrification. Everybody seems to be looking for that suburb that's the next fill in the blank. Yep. Um, <clears throat> how do you find that suburb before it becomes the next? Is it possible or is it something that we're... It can only be known in hindsight. Predicting the future. You and I have discussed that. Uh, how do you predict the future when it hasn't happened? I like You've sent me emails on that, Daniel, and I really like that one. How do you predict the future when it hasn't happened? Look, Melbourne is a radial city, and so all of the transport links and all of the pub- public transport and freeways are like the spokes on a bicycle wheel, and the CBD is sitting in the middle. And, and generally what it is, it's the proximity to the CBD. So um, we had, um, we've got a lovely lady who helps us clean our house and she's been with us for a long time. She just moved out to Cranbourne North and I live very inner suburban. And she said the other day she was leaving our house at five o'clock. I said, how long will it take you to get home, Bonnie? She said, two and a half hours. So I go out to Chatston and I'll have something to eat and I'll do a bit of shopping and then I'll go later. I said, two and a half hours. Now, you think about this. If you're working in the city where you generate your money, if you're not catching the train and you're driving your car, that's five hours a day. That's 25 hours a week just burnt, not to mention the wear and tear and the cost. So people uh, generally, the closer you are to the city, the more valuable the property. And the gentrification sort of came really back from the early days. You've got to remember Albert Park and Port Melbourne was the greatest left wing. um, But have a look, Port Melbourne is really walking distance to the city. I mean, how could it not become gentrified? How could it not escalate in value? So when you you take a, a radial view, and of course Newport, Williamstown, and the arc right around Port Melbourne, Albert Park. I mean, you've got that sort of South Yarra tour at Hawthorne Q, Armadale Wedge, which has always been um, really the blue ribbon suburbs, if you want to put it that. But uh, Newport, Williamstown, and then the suburbs rippling out. So I would say to you, it's not a magic formula. It's just buy as close to the city as you can within your affordability. But probably one of the most important things Here's the analogy. If shares are trading, and this is what you do, if Commonwealth Bank shares are trading today, and I just use those as an example because everyone knows Commonwealth Bank, and um, I'm going to go on my little uh, handheld right now, Daniel, and we'll let, let's make it a very accurate analogy. Commonwealth, uh, 20 minutes ago, traded at $71.48. So if a buyer wants to buy those shares, he's got to pay $71.48. How would it be if the buyer paid $100 for those shares? Bad for the buyer. Why? Because he's paid above the market value. And with shares, there is a price tag on them every minute they're trading during the day. With property, there isn't a price tag that's trading every minute of the day. And so I would urge buyers to go to as many open for inspections as possible, to collect the brochures, to note the differences between the properties and to understand why one property sold for this and another property sold for that. Because what happens is if they're out there looking for a property and they've been looking for three months or five months, all of a sudden, bang, there's going to be one passed in or there's going to be an opportunity in front of them, right in front of their face. And if they've done the research and they know that they've seen 50 properties and they've seen what they've sold for and they're looking at it and they go, 
Holy smoke, this one's just passed in at $870,000. And one identical to that sold around the corner for nine hundred and fifty dollars last week, and it's identical, buy it. Because he's buying under the market. Whereas if you just stroll in and pay 10% too much for the property, then there goes your capital growth for the first couple of years. You see, you see what I'm saying. So, it's it's not about it's not about people. That that's one of the uh, one of the big questions that people people always like to tell me what they paid for their property, how much it's gone up, and I always say to them, "You made a mistake," and they look at me, "What's the mistake?" I said, "You didn't buy two. Oh, 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 oh yes, they say, but I couldn't afford it back then when I bought one. So people, th- that that is one of, of the big mysteries, and the other one. Um, people always say, what's the next best suburb, Paul? Where do I buy next to make the most money? And the answer is, it can be any suburb. Because if if you uh, buy a property, let's suppose um, someone, their business has failed, the banks are ringing them every day, they're in default under their mortgage, um, their wife's walked out and left them, they've got a lot of problems and they go to auction and it's passed in at a lower figure and they are in diabolical trouble because they need a sale the smart person that's done the research that understands the market will be able to buy it their good fortune unfortunate for the people selling because they are able to make a decision they don't go oh look i've got to go away and think about it i'll give you a ring tomorrow or the next day and they come back it's gone they're able to make a decision on the spot. And so it's more about understanding the market so you can make a quick decision. I don't think I've ever met anyone in 38 years that's bought the first house that I've shown them. I think people like to go out and have a bit of a look around because they don't trust what real estate agents tell them. They like to they like to get their own spin on it. So it's not the gentrification and it's not what's the next best suburb. It's understanding. So generally, um, uh, obviously a ripple from the CBD and running out and the prices cascade downwards the further you go out. Understand your market. Understand your market so when a good, a good opportunity is in front of you, you seize it. You don't walk away from it. So two more myths and then we're, we're done with the myth-busting section. Underquoting, is that still happening? A lot less um, because the, uh, um, the government have dropped the legislation on and and um, no, I'm 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 not seeing blatant. Um, there was a couple of agents pinged. Uh, I think it was Fletcher Parker was pinged, and Hocking Stewart were pinged for it, and and uh, they got a massive fine, and um, the legal fees were substantial, and they were um, clearly because they were fined and convicted, found guilty. But no, I'm not seeing much of it. But you've got to understand, um, the government was trying to legislate a market and you can't legislate the market value of something. Water will find its own level. And from 2009 through to 2015, the property prices went up a lot. So it was actually bloody hard to put prices on things because, you know, we would put a price on something and uh, it would sell quite a bit more and some of them I just walk away and thought I should have got a kicker on the uh, authority on that one because I've missed out because it really went hard. The opposite's happening now. So you know this legislation comes about in boom markets but when the market turns and things start selling below what is the expected price people don't complain on that and they haven't (laughs) re-legislated to look after the vendors on that one. So uh, no really I think I really do think the underquoting uh, is in check. Certainly, agents are very aware of it, and they're very aware of uh, the fines and the implication because um, CAV have held up a couple of very big scalps in the marketplace and said, "Look a year, boys. This is what'll happen to you if you do it." So, um, so for two reasons: one, um, the legislation's in place; two, you've seen what's happened to someone who did it; and three. The prices aren't galloping away anymore; they're retreating. So, for those reasons, it's it's uh, I don't see it happening. Okay. So, final myth-busting question. This is a question from my wife. Does staging what's, what's, what's your wife's name? Leah. Leah. This okay, Leah. This Leah. is for you. <clears throat> Does staging a property for sale make any difference? Huge. So, um, when you when Leah when 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 you walk someone into a property. If 
The property is presented beautifully, the windows are cleaned, the furniture is appropriate for the property. You know, I go into some properties, the couch is too big, the kitchen table's too big, you can't even walk through it. The scuff marks on the wall, you know, there's crap on the carpet, the windows are filthy, the garden hasn't been done. Uh, you know, you walk in, it's the vibe of the house and you go, oh shit. So what happens is the first thing the buyer does, oh, I'm going to have to re-carpet, I'm going to have to repaint. Um, uh, you know, it needs a whole reno. Th- this is their mindset, okay? Because see, you, you don't know what's going through the mind of a buyer. You don't know how many they've inspected before. You don't know what their motivation and purpose for buying is. You, you, don't, you don't tip them upside down and ask for their asset and liability and their profit and loss statement before they walk in. So you take them on first spec. So if they walk in and the place is really well merchandised and um, for whatever, and when you stage a place, you, you can mask shortcomings in the floor plan or in the property um, so that um, they're not as glaring. And what happens is when someone walks in and you can smell that there's been baking going on and there is coffee, that aroma of coffee, because I like that smell, you know, you walk in. Um, <clears throat> let's put it this way, you know, if, if it was one of those garbage trucks on a 45 degree day that's been collecting garbage and it's got that fish slurry, you know, slurping all around in the bottom and the truck accelerates down the road <laughs> and the whole road's got gallons of that slurp that's it's like revolting. You, you could imagine if you walked into a house and it smelt like that. I mean, it's positive, negative. It's like up, down, in, out, black, white. If you walk in and everything sits with the buyer and the presentation is perfect. The buyer's not saying then, I've got to repaint it, I've got to recarpet it, because as soon as they start saying that, repainting's going to cost 50000 carpet's going to cost 50000 you know, all these, well, it's not, but that's what they do. So they're they're, 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 yeah. Yes, of course, because they're setting you up, because every buyer wants to buy as cheap as possible. They're setting, they're setting you up to crunch. Now, you know, the example is if you've got a mortgagee auction and they've ripped all the bloody uh, stove and the uh, the dishwasher and the blinds and the carpets and, you know, you go into it and there's not even any toilet paper on the toilet paper roll and you walk in, you say, gee, wow, you know, the, the, the guy's done a run. And now if you took that exact same property and staged it, the result will be significant. So, yes, um, definitely staging helps. Makes it more liquid too. You encourage more buyers. More buyers, better prices. So a couple of other miscellaneous property questions and then we'll let you go. You've been very generous with your time this morning. I'm enjoying it. It's fun. It is. I'm having fun. I'm learning a lot too. Yeah. How can you tell whether a renovation will add value or overcapitalize your property? You you mean, do I renovate or not? Yeah. Uh, It's a very good question. Um, And I get asked that a lot and I go in and I help people with that. Um, it depends whether the renovation it depends whether it's going to bring the house up to be a marketable commodity or the things that you are going to renovate that are particular to you have no value in the market for example sometimes pools add no value I've sold a lot of houses to people who have filled the pools in because they've got little kids and they don't want them to drown so that, that that's a very interesting one Someone might say, well, I'm going to put a lift in it because I've had a hip replacement or my knee's bung. And and again, you know, generally on a house, you might spend $150,000 putting a lift in and it adds very little value. So, someone else might put, and this is an exaggeration, might put new tapware in the bathrooms and it's 24 karat gold. And I'll say, well, that'll add no value because taps are taps. Um, but if you want 24 karat gold because that's your personal taste, I can't stop you. The things that uh, the things that add value is you've got to have a look at a, at a comparable sale that has the attributes that you are hoping to add to the house and have a look at the sale price of that. So if you're looking at doing a two-storey addition, it's a single-fronted Victorian house and you're looking at doing a two-storey addition at the back and you're going to add two extra bedrooms and a bathroom and uh, then pretty easy to check the sales of houses that are similar and say, well, I saw one sold for 1.7 million, almost the same as what's going to be what I'm anticipating the finished renovation. Uh, My house is worth a million at the moment um, and the renovation is going to cost me $400,000 to do that. 1.4, 1.7, there's 300 margin. And my intention is not to flip it. My intention is to live here for the next 10 years. Then I'd say, go ahead and do it. Because whatever the construction costs are today, 
it's going to be a damn sight cheaper than if you do it in five years or ten years. So if you're doing a renovation, have a look at what the market value is of your house renovated, compare it with what's going on in the market, and then have a look at the sum cost of the cost of the renovation, because the finished house might be worth 1.7 million, your house might be worth 1 million, and the renovation might cost 700,000. So there's no money to be made line ball, but you might say, look, my parents live next door, the kids go to school around the corner, I don't want to move out of the area, and I'm going to stay here for 30 years. Well, you can't argue with that. Do the renovation, because you're not so much overcapitalizing it. But if your renovation, um, and we'll use the same example, um, if you were going to renovate it, uh, and it was going to be very similar to a house around the corner that's just sold for 1.7 and your house is currently worth a million but the renovation is going to cost a million so it's going to owe you two million and the sales are indicating you're only going to sell it for 1.7 and you're not going to intend to live there for a very long period I would say don't do that renovation because you're going to rip up money Clearly, you're going to rip up money. So that's that's what determines whether to renovate or not. Are you considering renovating, Daniel? I, Leah, I, are you putting pressure on Daniel to renovate? <laughs> no, she's not putting pressure. She's very good that way. Well, I have a very understanding wife. That's I'm lovely. Very lucky. Same as my wife. Well, I do live in a two-bedroom house, and I do have soon to have two children. So this question of uh, do we move, do we stay, do we... Renovate is uh, Burning it's, it's a live one. Two beds in one room at the moment for the kids, and that's fine. They can have fun doing that. Yeah, that's right. They'll they'll get to know each other a lot better. Yes. Do kitchens and bathrooms really sell houses? Yes, they do. Look, the 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 kitchen family room is the big room. You know, when I was brought up in the '60s, we had the good room that we never used, the formal lounge and the formal dining, and we had a kitchen meals. And my mum and dad put a family room on the back, so it was kitchen meals family. We were in it all the time. We used the good room, as we called it, uh, well, I think once a year on Christmas Day. I think that was it. It's kind of pathetic, isn't it? You know, the good room. Well, growing up uh, as a child of Italian migrants, every Italian family had the good room. Had the good and room. And the only time you go there was basically when somebody got married or died. Yeah. It, it Drop like, off the presents for the wedding or the christening or something. It's like hilarious, that. isn't yeah. it? So, you know, what's, what sells houses is uh, the kitchen meals family room, most important room in the house, the bathrooms, master bedroom and the ensuite. Um, th those are the key ingredients. Um, and then, you know, following on from that, the aspect, the yard, you know, the garage, the style of the house, the location, the position, the street, and so on and so forth. Okay, very good. So wrapping up, I want to ask you one final question. We may have touched on some of these points earlier, but what were some of the lessons that you had to learn the hard way? In your career in real estate? Yeah. I, um, I had an unencumbered house. I lived in South Yarra and um, I had an unencumbered house. Um, I paid the mortgage off, but the banks had taken cross guarantees of commercial properties that I'd had. And in 1988, when everything was doubling in value, nothing was a problem. And I remember saying to my bank manager, I said, Chris, can I come and pick up the title, get a discharge? And, yes, Paul, anytime, come and get it. And then when 1990, I never did. When 1990 hit, I rang him up and I said, Chris, I'd like to come and pick up my title. Sorry, Paul, it's cross-securitized with all the commercial stuff and we've revalued that. Now, fool me, when I could have got it, if I'd gotten that title out, I would have had an unencumbered title to my house. Um, and I already alluded to that with the banks. Give them the least security, borrow the most on the least security, and security is mortgage a registered mortgage debenture charge on a company and a personal guarantee. That, that was a big lesson that I learned. So as I rebuilt myself in the early 90s, um, I would take the titles off the bank as I paid them down. Never leave excess security with the bank. Take it off the table. That, that, that was a lesson that was a hard one to learn. And I, I was one of these people when I was dealing with the bank when they asked the question, I told them, everything and probably too much and so I learned only to tell them what they need to know because uh, writing down on an asset and liability you know a whole lot of other things all you were doing is setting yourself up for 
them to come and get you. So I learned that. And then the one piece of advice is that I always say to people, when you take a loan, set up a little fund in a separate bank and have your own, have your own leave 12 months of payments up your sleeve. You know, you don't know if you lose your job. You don't know if you're, uh, you know, a trade on the trade. You blow your knee playing footy or go skiing or you have a car accident or something happens and you're unemployed or you can't get back. Leave yourself some breathing space so that you can continue to meet your repayments because if you do that, the banks will never talk to you. It's only when you don't. And these days, these days, they're now talking about credit scores and so the banks can report on you if you're late on your credit card payments, if you're late on your mortgage payments, if you're late on your car payments. So always have the reserve, never overcommit and beware. Yes, beware. Thank you for those lessons uh, earned through tough experience. It's been a pleasure chatting all things real estate and property with you today. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Daniel, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, I hope someone gets something out of what we've said today. I'm sure they will. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.